We are talking about Metals One. It listed just one year ago, and it is advancing strategic minerals projects in Finland and Norway. It's made in joke inferred mineral resource for its black schist project in Finland is 57.1 million tonnes. That's more than double the previous estimate. So the bunting came out for that joke inferred mineral resource. Now, the total value of the company's in situ metals across its portfolio is now standing at some 3 billion US dollars. That in itself should make the chief executive, Jonathan Owen, equally doe-eyed. Jonathan, over to you. Thank you, Sarah. No, absolutely. You know, I was I was cautious about throwing big numbers around, but having just sat through three rather compelling investment propositions, uh, you know, offering exposure across commodities and life cycle stages, big numbers being thrown around, I thought I'd better follow suit, but you've done it for me. So yeah, within 12 months of listing, we've amassed $3 billion worth of strategic metals in the ground. Plus, we've got our independent economic assessment or preliminary economic assessment in the pipeline on the way, We're hoping to have that done in Q4. And that'll shift a lot of that value onto the balance sheet and uh, underpins you know, our transition from a sort of explore discovery play it, truly into project development. So it's been a, you know, a very, very quick 12 months for us as the team and uh, uh, things are only accelerating. So let me take you through uh, the the latest uh, corporate debt. This is recently updated following the resource estimate that uh, Sarah you alluded to a moment ago. Um, so uh, quickly through the disclaimer, please read this in your own time, and um, uh, we'll move through to an overview of the of the company. So Metals One, as we've just discussed, we listed in uh, end of July last year. Uh, a tough market, I have to say. I think we're one of only four to successfully list on AIM uh, in 2023. And um, but you know we were we were active straight out of the blocks, drilling in Q4 uh, in in Finland and in Norway as well, and then uh, various uh, assay work, uh, mineral resource assessment updates. And now uh, we're going straight into the preliminary economic assessment stage uh, for the finished project. So, so who are we? What, what are we doing? Metal Swan, uh, really our focus is on identifying and developing sources of the uh, the technology metals or strategic metals, nickel, zinc, copper, uh, cobalt, et cetera, that are required to underpin the uh, the green transition and the digital transition in, in Europe. You know, in Europe, we'll talk about the legislation in the moment, uh, but there is uh, a raft of new legislation that's come into place that is really driving the onshoring of these uh, the sources of these raw materials to Europe. So placing less dependence on traditional sources, which can be Russia, China, Indonesia, et cetera, and, um, and, and bringing both security of supply, but also having a view on the sustainable nature of these sources as well. So we're very much about identifying low carbon sources within Europe for the European market. Um, so we came to the market in July uh, last year. We came to market with two cornerstone projects. Uh, we have the Rana project in Norway. Uh, this is a JV with Kings Rose Mining listed ASX. Uh, we have a farming agreement there. It's worth around about eight million pounds in terms of free carry to us. So uh, yeah, Kings Rose are on the ground doing the work um, and uh, paying for that, of course, and buying into the project, currently sitting at eighty percent ownership. That'll that'll move uh, as they continue drilling this uh, this next uh, few months to around about fifty uh, percent. Uh, so our focus really as a as an operational team is very much then on the Blackshus project in uh, Finland. Blackshus project uh, is a project we acquired off uh, Blue Jay Mining. Uh, we actually optioned it up a couple of years ago uh, when the nickel price was was a lot lower than it is today. So that value is really, you know, already locked in there. And, uh, you know, we inherited a 28 million tonne resource and have expanded that now to, as you said, nearly 57 million tonnes, Sarah. And uh, that's quite an important point for us and sort of important milestone for the company because that allows us the critical mass now to, to accelerate the roadmap to generate free cash flow to, to ultimately build, build the mining operations. Um, and as I mentioned, it allows us to shift the exploration expenditure now to the balance sheet, put some economics around the project MPV, IR, et cetera, and um, you know, look for alternative sources of non-dilutive funding as we move into the next uh, into the next stage, which I'll which I'll go into in a bit more detail in a moment. 
So as I mentioned, it's all about uh, following the you know the the, the fair winds and the and the fair seas of the European uh, drive towards the uh, the green energy transition, digital transition, and the demand for by 2030, 10 percent of those raw materials having to be sourced within Europe. And there aren't many sources of those uh, materials uh, currently in Europe, and, and not many projects in the pipeline. So we're one of one of only a handful, which is which is good for us when we come to look to EU grants, etc. Uh, there, there, that's um, you know, it's it's quite an open playing field. So a quick uh, view on who we are as a team. So quite a broad range of experiences and um, uh, and skills. So I'm a mining engineer. I've been uh, running mining operations uh, across across the world, mainly in Africa. Uh, also exploration operations. So I was uh, one of the founding directors of Helium One. So this is a couple of years pre IPO. So uh, I know David well and resonate very well with very much with his with his uh, excellent project in uh, in Montana. Um, I'm a fellow of the Geological Society, so I'm an unusually a mining engineer with a you know a, a good solid understanding of, of of the geology and the origination of, uh, of of all bodies such as the black schists. Alistair Clayton, our chairman, uh, he is our, as David called uh, his his team the big dog in the, on the board, uh, senior guy, uh, geologist by trade. In fact, he was a previous CEO of Finast, which became Blue Jay, which we then acquired the assets of. So he understands Finland. Uh, and Norway understands the project as well, so he brings uh, some historical context to it uh, for us. So there is, in that way, there is continuity. While we're a new a new business as such, we have that continuity uh, and you know, and sort of corporate understanding of, of what we have and what the potential is as well. Dan Mailing, CFO. So Dan's actually the founder of Metals One. He had the the, the, the sort of original idea to to pursue this uh, this opportunity in the market to to seek out the cornerstone projects. Option those up, and then and then kick off the process of getting us uh, getting us listed onto the stock exchange and, and trading. Uh, so really, really the three the three amigos that sort of day to day are driving the the company and the strategy. And we're then supported by uh, independent uh, non execs, uh, Craig Moulton, uh, Australian uh, geology geologist and financier, nickel expert. So again, he's uh, uh, in a, Brings a lot of strength to the board in terms of understanding the nickel, the nickel market downstream, as, as well as the uh, um, the the exploration and processing, etc. Uh, we have then uh, Sarah Minchin on the other side there, uh, non-exec director. Yes, related to to David Minchin. Uh, Sarah is a Finnish national. She is really the the she brings the sustainability, the ESG. That is her speciality. The um, to the lead on the community side to to the team, which is hugely important. Without social license to operate, it doesn't matter how good your asset is, um, you, you know, you're not going to get it off the ground. And you know, we've seen that in, in in harder jurisdictions like Africa, but it applies to Europe as well. So we're cognizant of that, and um, you know, we've got a, a lot of horsepower on the on the board uh, with Sarah being there. Thomas Levine, Winston Willisey then represent the vendors of the two cornerstone projects. So these projects are acquired uh, predominantly through through equity. Uh, so they remain. Uh, significant shareholders of the of, uh, of Metal Swan, and also of note, um, Blue Jay has recently extended its lock-in uh, with us as well. So they hold around just under twenty percent of uh, Metal Swan, and they continue to be locked up now till December twenty twenty-five. So that's that really sort of underlines their commitment to to our our investment proposition really, and their their interest in uh, in staying with us through the through the you know through the um, uh, through the process. So as I mentioned, we IPO'd in July 2023, so we're just going to be up to our 12-month anniversary. Uh, again, a lot achieved. We currently stand at a £3 million uh, mark cap, which, and I'll come on to sort of peer comparison in a minute, which is, which is you know, it, it's low, and we've got a lot of room to to grow and to uh, to, to grow that between, uh, you know, between now and really uh, getting into the, so the, the, the outcome of the preliminary economic assessment. We want that share price, that mark cap then to converge with, um, with the outcome of the uh, of the PEA, and again, I'll talk to that in a moment. Uh, Three billion dollars worth of assets sitting in the ground. That's nickel, copper, cobalt, zinc. It's a huge number, and uh, you know, it's 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 a big number for anyone. But our sights are to grow that to around about ten billion dollars, and that would make us a truly world class asset uh, in the in the technology metal space. 
I mentioned the £8 million investment carry. So the, the money raised during the IPO and uh, later placing is really focused on developing the Finnish assets, the, the Norway assets that look after themselves with uh, King's Row's uh, participation and uh, in investment on the ground there. Uh, so it's uh, so for us, our, our operating costs are, are very much covered by the cash in the bank. And uh, so we've got a good, good road, runway uh, in that respect. I mentioned the economic assessment. So we're moving unusually fast in this respect to, to quickly go through the stage gates of building um, a business case for a mine, uh, moving towards a financial investment decision. And um, the PEA is the first step in that. Typically, you, 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 you wouldn't see that for another year, couple of years at least with a, a, an exploration sort of discovery play. Like I say, we're moving into that development phase very quickly on the back of a solid asset in the ground. Um, that's, that's that's going to be easy mining, easy processing, and with clients on the doorstep. So I'll first uh, take a deep dive into the Blackshift projects in Finland. Uh, what we see here is the uh, the drill rig uh, during the last drill program back in uh, December 2023, so uh, a few months ago. As you say, it's, it's pretty low impact, um, self-contained uh, operations. Uh, very little impact on the environments. Um, Community is hugely supportive of these uh, of these activities. In fact, you know we we do have to chop a fir tree down now and then. These are forestry land. These are farmed uh, forests. This isn't natural forest here. Um, but the, you know the community is quite happy to come in and chop the trees down and take them off and fire as firewood, etc. And uh, you know it's it's a far cry from some of the challenges that we've seen some of our peers having in some more remote regions with, uh, with indigenous. Um, communities that are, that are all struggling or competing for resources, whether it's Sami, reindeer herders, et cetera. We, you know, we, we don't have that issue this far south in Finland. So where are we in Finland? So we're central, uh, central sort of east of Finland, so quite a way down south. We're away from the, the major areas, uh, the, the, the reindeer herders, the Sami indigenous tribes, and the uh, Natura 2000 national parks. We don't have reservations. We don't have those in our area. Um, and we, uh, the project area is really actually located across the Kainu Schist Belt. It's a belt of around about 90 kilometers north to south. And uh, we have uh, targets, exploration targets through, throughout this belt. Um, now, notably, we have R1, which is down the south. R1 is it's, it's the name of the original target before it was a resource. R being Ratavara, one was, 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 was the first target in the, uh, in, the, in the exploration pipeline. That was our 28 million tons that we acquired off. Uh, Blue Jay. We've since then developed P5, which sits up in Paltamo to the north. And um, as, as you saw a few weeks ago, announced the, the 29 million tons that we have there. We then have a, a range of other targets in the, across, this, across this area. In fact, we've got a significant expansion opportunity there. Um, you know, I put out a, when we first listed, you know, it's a rather arbitrary number, but I was, you, you've got to put out some stretch goals for yourselves and the team to to chase. And we put the number out there, you know, 200 million tons. That's where we need to get to. That's the $10 billion worth of assets in the ground that we need to chase if we want to be world class. And, you know, we're already at 60 very quickly within 12 months. We could be up to 90 within, within you know, another six months. There's more drilling to be done. And, uh, and very quickly, we'll be, up, we'll be up to that 200 million mark. And that's by virtue of the fact that we've got a good pipeline of high prospectivity targets already um, uh, res reserved in terms of reservations, tenements, uh, exploration permits, et cetera. We put barriers up to entry for, for others that, that, that often come in behind successful exploration companies and start bagging ground around their, their projects. We've, we've uh, very quickly um, done the desktop study of the area and put those reservations out to you know to protect us at first mover advantage. It's very low risk in our site in our minds. You know, it's, it, the, the major attraction to us for this project when we acquired it was the the fact that there is an existing operation, the Terra Farme operation, uh, just up the road, who are already mining this uh, this type of or the black schists. And they do it very well. Uh, this is a JV between Trafigura and the Finnish government. They uh, they've technically de-risked this for us significantly. This this is a, a low cost uh, operation, low cost in terms of easy mining, shallow, but in terms of the processing as well, extremely low cost. They use bio heat bleaching, um, and which you enjoy very high recovery. So they're enjoying I think ninety seven percent recoveries on nickel. So that's ninety seven percent of the nickel in their ore is actually finding its way to the customer, and they're getting paid for that. 
um, low cost and really to, to, to demonstrate how low cost they are in the light of you know, Indonesian nickel flooding the market. The, these guys, even when nickel is, is quite a low price at the moment, they're still generating 30, 35% EBIT quarter on quarter on quarter. So they are truly first, first quartile world-class uh, producers. And, and they're our model. That's what we're modeling our, our business against and our operations against. And um, um, you know their parameters will what will, will, will feed into our preliminary economic assessment. So hugely de-risk uh, de for us. Plus, then you overlay that with uh, uh, the, the the fact that this is a historical mining area. So, firstly, you've got skills and the service providers in the area already. That's often a quite a challenge, partic you know, particularly as in Eastern Europe or in Africa, uh, just to find the the workforce and the service providers. We have those on on tap here. Uh, plus, we have then communities that are extremely welcoming they they want to to stop the the flood of, of people leaving these areas and depopulating these areas uh, they want to bring employment opportunities back to these areas um so they're very pro mining pro uh paper uh paper mills pro pro logging etc and uh like i said before you know if you if you have that 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 license to operate you're you know you're halfway there so we undertook the mineral resource estimates uh, a couple of months ago, the outcome uh, was published two weeks ago. We commissioned Mining Plus, a global mining services provider, to, to do the work. Uh, this was for the, for the P5 asset up in Paltimo. And what you're looking at here is the is the block model, uh, model of the ore body as it sits just under the ground. So it actually sits that surface more or less. There's about five meters of, of glacial till or gravel that overlay this. But then it's, it's easy, soft mining. It's open pit mining. So what you're looking at there is the is the ore body uh, stretching down to about uh, the ore body itself, well, beyond 300 meters. You probably can't see that due to the perspective. But then the you have overlaid this, the, the preliminary pit design. So what is, what is the open pit going to look like? And as you can see, it's 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 going down to actually about 200 meters, and then we're, we're stopping. So the ore body itself actually continues to depth. We also believe it continues to the north and to the south as well. So while we're sitting with 29 million tons, uh, we will continue to to increase the size of this asset uh, over the next uh, you know, over the next uh, year to two years. Plus, also develop all you know the other targets that I mentioned earlier. So we've got so we set ourselves quite an ambitious timeline to to get through the various stage gates to ultimately to production and generating that key uh, that free cash flow I mentioned earlier. So. The, the target for us is 2030 to be in production. That aligns us with the EU benchmark for this, this the 10% uh, onshoring of the supply of strategic minerals for the European market. So you do a, a, a if you do a countdown schedule back from 2030 to, to where we are today, you, you soon realize you've really got to get a shift on to, to meet that. And it is ambitious, but we believe it is it is achievable if we execute perfectly. And 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 frankly, today, you know, my team has executed perfectly. You know, we've delivered on time in terms of drilling, on budget, uh, same with the mineral resource estimates and all the various assays, desktop studies, uh, GFs that, that, that have come to this point as well. Um, and uh, we, we don't doubt that we'll, the, the team, well, I don't doubt the team will be able to continue to deliver that. The, the you know, there are various critical path items that, that can hold up this process. And they tend not to be technical in nature. They tend to be more environmental, social baseline, uh, environmental baselining studies, uh, the permitting process itself. Um, you know, in the states, we hear about permitting processes taking fifteen to twenty years for, like, um, you know, uh, Rio Tinto's resolution copper and, and in Nevada and, uh, and and you know, large, well-known projects like that. Here, traditionally, Finland uh, and Scandinavia in general, you don't have those uh, those those long durations for permitting. However, we do benefit from the new EU legislation. The Critical Raw Materials Act, which came into force this year, actually puts a cap on, for the each member country, the cap on how long that permitting can, can last. And the, the cap for Europe is 28 months. So that permitting process must, must be completed within 28 months. Um, the other critical path item then is also the, the, is the environmental baselining and the social engagement, all those critical path items, we're, we're front-loading into the work program as much as we can to de-risk any slippage further down the line. So you'll see this year we'll be kicking off the environmental and social, uh, social uh, studies uh, quite shortly. We've got the PEA going now. Uh, that what the PEA does for us 
other than give us the project economics that we can you know start to show potential um, uh, institutional investors uh, it allows us to apply for strategic project status in the eyes of the EU it's a capital S capital P strategic project status and that offers us a couple of things it offers us uh, that permit fast tracking that I just uh, spoke to but also uh, opens up the options for EU grants and other non-dilutive funding options which is quite unusual at this what is still a relatively early stage in the in a you know mine's life cycle um but you know Europe are forward thinking in this respect they do see the issues the social and environmental issues that are that are um, that are, that are starting to boil over in um, in Indonesia with the nickel supply there, the Chinese funded nickel supply there. We see it in New Caledonia with the strikes that have shut down effectively 6% of nickel supply globally over the last few months uh, due to the displacement of communities, environmental destruction, et cetera. So, um, so all these are fair wins for us. Sorry, Jonathan, you're overrunning now. So if you'd like oh, to I within a minute, <laughs> that would be great. Okay. So, Quickly running through uh, PA this year, we want to move into the pre-feasibility next year quite quickly on the back of that. Uh, and that will uh, also involve uh, having the strategic project status to, to, to grease, grease the way through that through this process and ultimately get into production by 2029. If we do, I just want to stop on this one, Sarah, on this slide really, just in terms of doing a peer comparison of where we are. There aren't many direct comparisons on this side of the water, but if we look across the water to the, the TSX, uh, there are a number of uh, nickel copper uh, either uh, early exploration or development plays uh, that have significantly higher mark caps than uh, than ourselves with similar uh, with similar size um, deposits in terms of nickel equivalent tons in the ground so we're sitting at around about 180,000 uh, tons of nickel in the ground uh, and as you can see for yourself we're orders of magnitude undervalued compared to our peers so so our job apart from the day-to-day -day operations and executing perfectly is to is to really push the message and you know broaden the the distribution of our message and our value proposition as, as wide as we can and um, and bring that more liquidity into our stock. So I'll I'll leave it there then, Sarah. Uh, I think that's uh, that's time for Q and A. It is, and I'm just looking at that um, slide that you've got up. Therefore, are you on the wrong exchange, or is it an ambition to perhaps dual list? on the TSX once the um, preliminary economics assessment has been released? Yeah, that's that's a very good question. The, I mean, certainly certainly we, we won't be doing anything before, before that PA is, is released. Um, and like I said, the idea is that that unlocks that strategic project status and the non-dilutive funding that, that comes with that. So it becomes maybe maybe less of, less of an issue. It'll be interesting to see how the the London markets react to you know the interest rates hopefully dropping as the as the forecast uh, later in the year and see if that picks up. You know, if Labour would be kind enough to you know insist that pension funds actually invest in in their own in their own stock markets, you know that could that could trickle on down to the AIM market as well, which would be which would be very welcome. So all options open, but um, you know the focus now is to deliver and uh, and to get the message out and to get the liquidity in the market they're already in. OK, so you've allowed me to ask a, po a politically charged question. You talked about EU grants there. So Brexit, it hasn't put the roadblock on any um, potential EU grants for a UK listed business? No, these, these are European projects. They're in Europe. And uh, they they fall under, you know, we have, we have European entities uh, under which these sit. So no, there's, there's no, there's no blockage there. Excellent. Now, there was a question sent in ahead um, of this webinar. It was from Jasmine, and she, she asks, what was the purpose of the capital reorganisation and what do you envisage the benefits to be to existing shareholders or are there, there any negative outcomes following the capital reorganisation? So perhaps it would be good, Jonathan, if you were to summarise what that reorganisation was about and what the outcomes um, have been. Yeah, I, I, I sort of considered it as a, as a non-event in terms of new slow after after the fact, um, but I, I realised that it, you know it, it, it is it is of interest to people. So, as you as as, as Jasmine probably knows, we uh, had a placing recently at at one p, which which was our then par value. Um, now the the challenge with, with that is that. Um, you know, we go through an audit. We were going through an audit at the same time. The recommendation was that we 
we need to take a proportionary measure and drop that par value down to ensure that we continue to comply with the capital market requirements. Uh, so that's all around sort of liquidity and solvency going forward. So that's that's really the only reason. We, we don't really see any any other benefits um, uh, or or opportunities in that uh, in that. Hence why you know I I'd have probably thought it was a, a non-event, but yeah, important to to raise it. There you go. Our shareholders and potential shareholders certainly doing their research. Um, two questions come come have come in from Deba, who says, "What significant sources of capital have you pinned down to further the project?" It's a yeah. It, it's it, it's something that we address. We will address uh, once the PEA is completed. As I mentioned, uh, we will be looking to move very quickly into the pre-feasibility phase. Plus, we want to continue the resource drilling and to continue to build that uh, that asset base. Um, you know, number one it, for us is to uh, secure significant non-dilutive funding in the form of EU grants, uh, EU project financing, uh, and um, and and then look to uh, ideally secure a, a large cornerstone institutional investor um, and, uh, and and you know and fund that way now we are conscious that these those raises can be diluted but it is the nature of the business that we're in we're not producing revenue so we are we are spending um and the the you know the the task for us as the management team is to ensure that the perceived value of metals one in the market tracks up with what we believe is our inherent value. So what I mean by that is when we get to the completion of the, of the PEA, we'll have an MPV, we'll have an IR and CapEx and so on. And, you know, you could arguably attribute a percentage of that MPV to the to the enterprise value, to our inherent value, whatever that might be. And, um, you know, really we need to ensure that that, that that market cap, that share price tracks up to converge with that later in the year so that when we do come to the market and need to do a placing you know we're protecting long-term holders uh we're not uh, we're not pulling anyone under water and i think it's important to, to point out that that we're all significant shareholders in, in the company as well I mean, collectively as, as a board we're, we're sitting at around about 10 percent uh we then have another around about nine uh, percent sitting in the employee benefit trust and uh and then the two vendors the two project vendors pendra group so blue j and srh are both sitting with about 20 percent each and, and and locked up for a significant amount of time as well the so darby's second question has tickled me it's it's bringing out the mischief maker in me. He says, bearing in mind the advantages you have covered, why was this project overlooked for the past 20 years? Now, don't get paranoid. You only look late 20s. I'm quite sure he's not saying, where were you 20 years ago? But, um, yeah, yeah, why was it overlooked by um, people who have crossed that uh, terra firma before you? Yeah, it's... it's, it's uh... I, I often ask ask the, the you know my, myself that and uh, and the vendors. I think, you know, we we had an advantage. We we saw opportunities in these assets that maybe previous owners hadn't seen. And um, uh, now that, that's an that's an easy answer. But to, to give you that into perspective, if you look at the P five resource estimate that we that we recently released, we managed to achieve that without any drilling. Um, we recognise that that asset, the the core the core samples, the assays that were undertaken originally, sort of fifteen years ago on that on that asset, hadn't been done correctly. They were u- done using sort of handheld, yeah, XRF devices like Star Trek, um, court, you know, tricorders, something different, not particularly accurate, and wouldn't hold up a mineral resource estimate. So we basically went back and uh, got those cores chemically assayed, the gold standard for assays, and um, and there, bang, there you go, twenty nine million tons. So. So it's those kind of opportunities that that we saw that people hadn't hadn't seen before, and um, and the other challenge I think uh, for others looking at this, looking for these kind of opportunities from a distance, is that you have Terra Farme who are active already, that are have got a very successful business mining and processing this material. They're not a publicly listed company. It's very hard to get the information and the parameters and understanding of what their oil and sustaining cash cost is, their labour cost per ton. Uh, it's quite opaque. We we have we have an advantage in, in that um, you know we have a good grasp of that between us, being mining engineers, geologists, etc., uh, nickel experts. Uh, so again, it's 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 going in there with its eyes wide open, where others are probably got one eye shut. Okay, so finally, because it's me that's overrunning now. Um, so the Black Schist project's one hundred percent owned. 
uh, you've got significant skin in the game. Uh, right at the beginning, you were talking about, you know, that the pathway to uh, free cash flow is a, a possibility. Um, when would you like to see positive free cash flow? Well, I'd, I'd like to see it in 2030. Um, I'd, I'd be quite happy to see a very nice offer coming along from a, from a major mining company in the meantime that that that, that you know sweeps us off our feet. That would be that would be very welcome as well. But whatever's you know whatever releases the value soonest and is, is a fair reflection of the value that that we've generated. I think uh, we'll we'll look at all all opportunities. But just to correct you on the hundred percent. So currently we're sitting at around about ninety three percent. So Gunsin, the, the previous farming partner um, uh, who we who we bought out continues to hold about 6% and we have an option to acquire that back off them within the next two years, which we'll, we will do at the right time for us. Forgive me for that error. It was a minor one, but so I'm good that <laughs> Gunsin's on board. Uh, Jonathan Owen, Chief Executive of Metals One, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for, for being our, our final act and what has been a really good webinar. Thank you very nice. much. Thank you, Sarah.